Welcome to the Successful Athletes Podcast presented by Trainer Road, where we interview successful athletes to make you a faster cyclist. This week, we are joined actually straight from Leadville, Colorado, but with a home base in Boulder, Colorado, by Kate McLaughlin. How are you doing, Kate? I'm doing well, Jonathan. How are you? Great. We're going to talk about how you won the Leadville Silver Rush 50, which is a totally unique event, different course to the Leadville 100, and your build up to Leadville 100, but you did so at with a whole lot of, of obstacles, uh, getting put in your way. And we're going to go over all of that today and all the things you did for that. So, um, I'm stoked to do this with you, especially to talk about mountain bikes. I'm, I'm spoiled in this case. That's what I'd like to do most. <laughs> I'm excited uh, to be here. <laughs> yeah. You weren't always a mountain biker though, right? What was your athletic background? Uh, yeah. So I pretty much grew up running track and field. I also played soccer. Uh, but I started running track and field when I was 10 years old. And I competed in track and field in college, uh, did the heptathlon. So oh, wow. a whole slew of events. I was a, uh, I was, was it master Jack of all trades, master of none. Um, so I was pretty good at all the events in the heptathlon. Um, my best event was probably high jump, but yeah, I didn't start cycling until I moved to Colorado from New York city in, uh, about five years ago. Um, and then I started really getting into mountain biking, uh, about two years ago. So you've had like a really a background of aerobic endurance training and competition for years with soccer and with heptathlon. So did, which yeah. actually, can you describe what some people may not know what heptathlon is? Um, and I'm yeah. not entirely sure, but I know <laughs> that it's a collective like GC basically of different track and field events, right? Yeah, exactly. So for women, uh, the indoor we call it the multi, uh, because indoor it's five events and outdoors it's, uh, seven events. So, uh, for the outdoor, the heptathlon, it's, um, I'll just run through the events. It's the hundred meter hurdles, long jump, high jump, shot put, which is funny. Cause I was really bad at it. Uh, javelin, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 800 meters and the 200 meters. So, the distances running wise went everything from a hundred to an 800, which is a half mile. So wow. yeah, quite the broad range of events for the running races. Which distance were you best at? The 800. Definitely. So that longer. was the the longest one. Yeah. I definitely trended towards the longer events, but didn't do anything too long until after college. Um, when I started doing, uh, the occasional half marathon just to, uh, keep my competitive spirit, alive, if you will. Sure. So th that's interesting. So you, you did well at the longer distances, but then you also did well at, at, uh, was it long jump or was it high jump that you did best at? Yeah. High jump was my best event, which is interesting. Cause that's more like fast twitch explosive sort of, uh, you clearly have to be also like, you know, a tall athlete, I would assume, but why, uh, why do you think you did best with both of those? Cause they seem like yeah, they're on opposite ends of the spectrum. For sure. Uh, high jump is surprisingly much more technical than about explosive power. Like, um, you know, the test where you just, I don't even know what it's called, but you just jump as high as you can and, and see how high you can go, how high yeah. you can grab. So like that was, I'm terrible at terrible, but if you want me to jump off of one leg and get over a, a high jump bar, I can do that. So I think hmm. for some reason, the technical aspect of high jump just clicked with me. Um, and then just generally, I think I have a more of an endurance athlete than a sprinter. And by, I think, I mean, I know that I'm much more of an <laughs> endurance athlete than, than sprinter. Yeah. So you're getting into mountain biking once you're in Colorado, I'm going to like fast forward a bunch with this. What led you to, cause your main goal is Leadville, which is coming up here in just a couple of weeks, which is super exciting. Mm -hmm. Um, but what made you get to the point where you were like, I want to do Leadville 100, one of the hardest mountain bikes routes to finish. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, how <laughs> Still do I unsure. summarize this? <laughs> how do I summarize it? Okay. So when I first started like really falling in love with mountain biking, it coinciding coincide coincidentally with when I started dating my, my boyfriend, Ryan. Uh, so Ryan is a very strong mountain biker, cyclist, all of the above. And so it, that timing really worked out well for me to learn a lot. Um, so I was actually, I thought I wanted to do triathlons. I thought I wanted to do Xterra triathlons, um, which for those of you who don't know, it's, uh, off-road triathlon. So swimming, 
not my strong suit, by the way. Uh, swimming <laughs> mountain bike, yeah, swimming <laughs> mountain bike trail run. And so last last year, yeah, beginning of 2020, uh, I was like, okay, I'm going all in on this triathlon. Like, I'm going to do everything I can to do well. So I started doing regimented training for that. And I realized I hated swimming more than I even thought. And <laughs> I just, all along the way, I started falling more and more in love with mountain biking. And uh, the year, let's see, in 2019. So before I even decided that I, uh, oh, sorry, I'm getting my timeline mixed up. Yeah, no. So 2020, sorry, was all in all the training for a triathlon, realized I hated swimming. And then, so I was just running and mountain biking, but I still was like, man, mountain biking is so much more fun than running. And I, my love for it just grew and grew. Um, and Ryan, uh, actually started working for lifetime events, uh, and became the marketing manager for lifetime or sorry for the Leadville race series. So from afar, I was witnessing uh, all the excitement around these events. I was familiar with the Leadville 100 run, but not really the mountain bike. And I was like, that's crazy. I would never mountain bike hundred miles. Like 30 miles is a big ride for me. Like, why would anybody ever do that? <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, as time went on last year, like the months went by, I started doing longer and longer rides and really started enjoying it more and more. And I'm a very competitive person. And I was kind of competing with myself, like, Oh, I'm going to go longer. I'm going to do more climbing this ride. And then the real crux of it was last year, the day of the race, when it was supposed to happen, Ryan was in touch with his people and Leadville was like, oh yeah, it sounds like some people are still going to do it. You should do it. And I was like, no, why would I do that? And I was like, huh, maybe I should go do that hundred course. And it was like two (laughs) days before it. So uh, yeah, two days before the day it was supposed to be in 2020, I decided, well, I'll just go do it and like see how it goes. It didn't go great, but it went. <laughs> so I just like went up to Leadville that day with Ryan and did the course by myself with uh, no bike computer. So I didn't really have a route, um, wow. but I did it. I did it. I can I can go in more into that later. But anyway, it was a really cool experience, even though it was kind of a junk show. And I decided <laughs> that I would I would actually train to compete in it this year. So that's a long winded way of telling you how I decided. I would do the hundred. <laughs> That's perfect. We've got the the full background on it. So yeah, um, was your plan initially? So and this is something that Leadville does. They have their stage race, which actually breaks down the Leadville course into chunks, mm-hmm. and they have the Silver Rush Fifty, which actually an entirely different course. Um, so was the Silver Rush Fifty like basically like a stepping stone event for you to be able to? Because that was on your calendar. And uh, yeah, spoiler alert: you won it, which is amazing. <laughs> um, but was that on your calendar as like a execution practice day to basically see like how you could execute on that? Or why'd you put that one on there too? I decided to do that. So I signed up on like the last day of you were able to sign up. Um, but I decided to do that, uh, to get a better corral for the hundred. So Got it. my goal Smart. was to not start all the way in the back where if you don't do a qualifier, you start in the last corral, uh, mm-hmm. for the hundred. So that was my goal just to get a better corral. No other yeah. real goals. <laughs> <laughs> Smart choice. Smart choice for sure. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, your training and then the the injury that you uh, served. So what sort of training were you doing leading into that injury? And then we'll talk okay. about Okay. Yeah. So I had a rough year last year, as a lot of people did. But long story, very short, uh, I was unemployed, looking for a job in the fall um, when I decided I would sign up for the lottery for the hundred. So I had a lot of time on my hands, um, in between interviewing, but it was like, it was a rough period Mm. because I didn't expect it to take seven months to, to get a job, but mountain biking really during that time, like saved me. And it was like my real outlet to, to like stay motivated. Um, so it was pretty easy to get the training in then, but it was very unstructured. I was like, Oh, I'm going to go ride that trail today. Cause I really like it. Um, <laughs> but I did start doing a little bit of strength training. Uh, so going to the gym like twice a week. Uh, and that was all based off of things I learned in college doing strength train strength training for college track. So I kind of like knew what to do, uh, like at the baseline, you know? Um, and 
I know for me, because I've had that experience, that strength training makes a really big difference. So mm. I just started doing that and I immediately knew, noticed how, how much faster I got going downhill. Actually, I didn't see huge improvements at first on the uphill, but the downhill, I was like, oh, wow, this is awesome. <laughs> like I could do a full like 10 minute downhill without getting tired. So that was really fun. Um, and I didn't, but I still wasn't doing like a lot of structured training. Uh, I was doing a little bit of trainer road, like dabbling. Cause I mm. have listened to the podcast and, and I believe in the science of what you guys are saying. And so I like started dabbling with trainer road, but again, mm. not super committed. I was like, Oh, I'll get on a trainer road program. Like come winter, like real winter when I can get on a trainer and everything or force to get on a trainer and everything. Mm. Um, and the only reason I hadn't done trainer road sooner was because I just had like a very flexible schedule and was just kind of like having fun with it and not, not on a structure yet. Um, totally. So yeah. And then I started, let's see. Yeah. And then I started sprinkling more trainer road workouts in like January, February before I got injured. Um, and that, so that's where I was at going into my injury. Mm-hmm. So just starting to sprinkle in structure, but, uh, doing those fun rides that were also at the same time, giving you the fitness and the skills that you need. Um, yeah. what was the nature of your injury and how did it happen? Oh, um, yeah. So towards the end of March, uh, I was in Zion. So Ryan, uh, had a work event weekend and we went to just ride gravel bikes and enjoy some warmer weather in Zion. Uh, sounds in Southern Utah, if, uh, for those that don't know. Um, so we had just three, three days of big gravel rides. And on the last day we were getting some single track and I was so excited because I love mountain biking and single track. Mm -hmm. We were on like a, you know, more mountain, mountain bike esque trail. Um, and there were a lot of people in front of me that were on this ride. And while they're, most of them were much stronger riders than me not everybody was super comfortable on single track so it's kind of like a messy Mm -hmm. messy group going down the single track and a lot of breaking and I should have just walked at that point but I was being stubborn and I was on my gravel bike with no suspension um so yeah I went over the bars going down technical section on my gravel bike and for context I fall off my mountain bike a lot and usually I'm (laughs) fine um this I hadn't had a real mountain bike injury up until this. Um, but yeah, so I landed on my hand and I tore a ligament in my thumb. So, Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually called skiers thumb, uh, Mm -hmm. because a lot of skiers doing it, holding their poles when they fall, it causes your thumb to go the wrong Mm -hmm. way and and tear that ligament on the inside of your thumb. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I didn't go to the doctor for a week. So I was convinced I was fine. Uh, as a lot of us do, turns out I wasn't. Um, (laughs) so (laughs) Yeah, torn torn ligament in the thumb. And then you had to get surgery two weeks later, correct? Yeah. So how surgery long was, was yeah, yeah, how long go. was the recovery that you had to undergo or the predicted recovery? Yeah. So they told me three to four months before I would get back on a bike. Uh and uh I've learned since that my surgeon was pretty uh conservative, but he said it would probably be a year until things would feel normal. At this point, you're five months away from your race, from your goal event. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Exactly. So, oh. I, I mean, that was my first thought. Also, just like going back to what I'd said about the last seven months of looking for a job where mountain biking was like saving me from misery. And now I was faced with not being able to do that for three or four months. Um, Luckily, I'd just gotten a new job. I just accepted a job finally. So like silver lining, I got this job right before I got injured, Mm -hmm. accepted it. So that was, it would have been a whole lot worse mentally if I still was looking for a job and I had this injury. Yeah, but certainly tough to deal with because that's kind of like your, um, your outlet and you've built a relationship with the bike and how that's helping you get through everything. And everything doesn't just change one day to the next. You still want that outlet. That had to have been tough. Yeah. Oh yeah. It was very tough. Did you physically or sorry, mentally let go of your goal to do Leadville at that point? Or did you still hold on to it? Cause that can be another point for us endurance athletes. When we have a setback, what do we do with our mindset in relation in relation to our goals? I pretty much immediately pivoted into how am I going to make this even better? Like, how am I going to, mm accomplish my goals in a different way. Like 
I had a few friends pretty quickly ask me like, oh, are you still going to do Leadville? Like this timeline's not looking so good. And to me, I was, I was like almost surprised they asked, like, of course I'm doing Leadville. I'm going to make, I'm going to do better now. Like I'm going to structure this training so much that I can't, I can't do poorly. And Mm -hmm. um, obviously that's not necessarily true, but in my head, I was, I was very, very motivated to find creative ways to still be successful. So what, what did you end up doing to make the, to get more from the training that you were doing? Yeah. So I immediately signed up or I I was already using training road, but I immediately um, put a plan together through plan builder. Uh, That was step one. Uh, I chose a mid volume plan because I knew I wanted to, for me, being on the indoor trainer five days a week wasn't going to work. And I know myself well enough Mm -hmm. to know that wasn't going to work. So I chose a mid volume plan and decided I would go back to running, uh, specifically trail running. So that I would still get that climbing endurance and strength. Uh, So the mid volume plan allowed for, to sprinkle in days for that trail running. And on top of that, I immediately said, okay, I need to find a trail race to compete in a trail running race to compete in, to keep me even extra motivated. Mm. Um, so what my training looked like was basically two to three days of trail running and then three, three or four days on the indoor trainer. Did that math work out? Something like that around that. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I didn't necessarily do every, uh, trainer workout during those times I did most of them, but the ones that were skipped were because I was incorporating running. So Uh my profile in trainer road doesn't have the runs on it, but if you look Mm -hmm. at my Strava, you can see (laughs) the the full gambit. Sure. So you were planning on it. I like this approach of instead of just like tripling down on something that's mathematically and like on paper, very clearly driving toward your goal, you considered your needs as a person and you thought, well, I, I know that I'm going to derive a lot of benefit and joy from running. I know that I'm going to derive a lot of benefit from actually having an event that is going to be for running. So I'm going to prioritize that too. That's an important yeah. piece, right? Because motivation is really like the, if there's no motivation, there's no gas in the tank, right? Like things just aren't yeah. going to be able to happen. Uh, what exactly, what was difficult about this process for you? <laughs> because I'm sure plenty with the injury, but then also yeah. just even managing the motivation and training indoors so much and doing all that, what was difficult? How'd you get through it? Yeah, I would say right off the bat, the, the hardest part, um, and like the biggest, uh, the things that are most discouraging was it was super uncomfortable on the bike. So Mm -hmm. I had a cast. So the cast, uh, obviously, um, stopped my thumb from moving, but went up to my elbow essentially. So my wrist was straight too. So I was like in this uh, I don't know what you want to call that, but thumb pointing forward a little bit. So okay. not only was it not, Im- not only was it immobile, but also prevented me from doing a lot of things that you could do without a cast. So even on the trainer, I had to, like, I couldn't grab the handlebars. So my arm was mm-hmm. upright, like, like this, if you're just listening, you can't see this, yeah. but <laughs> because of how I had to do it, I couldn't put any weight on my left side. So I encourage you all next time you get on your, your gravel bike or a more aggressive stance bike, if you can't put any weight on one arm, it's really hard to like hold yourself up. Yeah. So right off the bat, I was discouraged. I was like, how am I going to get through three months of this? This is going to be miserable. Um, so we did, uh, <laughs> I got a little creative and <laughs> I like at one point, uh, taped like a laptop stand to the to the top of my drop bars <laughs> on the trainer. Nice. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, that helped a little bit. Um, but it never got comfortable. So mm. that was pretty discouraging, but after the first couple of weeks, I kind of got used to it. I think my body adjusted to not putting weight on that left hand. Um, and once I accepted that discomfort, got over that, but generally speaking, I mean, there were ups and downs. It wasn't always <laughs> easy. Uh, I distinctly remember like a couple of weekends where I was gone for the weekend, like skiing or not skiing. There was one weekend I did ski that was not (laughs) recommended, but I did, um, but gone for whatever reason. Um, and I came back and got back at like eight or 9 PM on Sunday. I was like, I don't want to do this training workout, but I missed like two this week because I was gone or traveling and I did it. And I felt so good after and I felt so accomplished. Mm. Um, so I think just those little little 
victories where I was like, hey, pat myself on the back. Good for me. I did that 9 p.m. Sunday trainer workout and uh, I know I'm going to be better for it. So that definitely kept me motivated. But then on the the running side for trail running, I started crushing my times like on Strava. I'm a big Strava person. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's living in Golden at the time, there's lots of trail runs right from the house. So I was doing a lot of the same runs repeatedly. And I started setting goals on the trail running. So I'd be like, okay, I'm going to go to that trail. I'm going to try to get top of whatever number and see how mm-hmm. I can do. So it was a mix of little victories on the indoor trainer, uh, or even just like having a good, good workout on the indoor trainer. Yeah. They're all really hard at first. And then once I started as soon as they weren't so hard, learning that third or fourth interval felt felt like I could do it. I mean, mm. that kept me motivated for sure. So a mix of things kept me motivated, but I'm not going to say it was easy or that yeah. it wasn't really hard to stay motivated. Um, but it's just important, I think, to just pick up on the little things and and appreciate them for what they yeah. are. How, how did you schedule your training? When were you doing your workouts? Uh, doing a lot in the morning. And at the time I was trying to remember, but I'm pretty sure it was getting dark pretty early then. Yeah. So like March it still wasn't light, super late. So, um, I would get up early and do most of my workouts or during lunchtime because my, I just started that job. So my schedule wasn't super packed yet. So, you know, fitting an hour 15 trainer workout is pretty doable at lunch compared to like having to pull your clothes on and go outside and, mm-hmm. and do get on the bike outside in the middle of winter or, you know, early spring when it's still cold. Um, so yeah. And then you had an FTP test partway through and you didn't get the results that you were anticipating getting. Let's walk through that because all of us here have had (laughs) ramp tests where afterward we're like, come on, really? Like I thought that I was going to be different. Yeah. Yep. I went into my first ramp test after I can't remember if it was four or six weeks of training. I want to say six. I I don't Mm -hmm. remember, but um, I was so excited. I was like, I can't wait to see what the number is. And like I said earlier, I'm a very competitive person, competitive with <laughs> myself. So I was so excited and it went up like three Watts. I went from <laughs> like two twelve starting to like two fifteen, and I was devastated. I was like, are you kidding me? How could this happen? I've worked so hard on and off the trainer for the last however many weeks. I couldn't even believe it. Like, I was shocked. It was the same. Mm. Um, yeah. So that was that was very disappointing. Yeah. How'd you, how'd you manage that? Like, what did you, and what did you pay attention to thereafter? Yeah. So I, I was just grumpy for <laughs> mad for like four hours probably. And then I like thought about it and Ryan at the time was like, this doesn't define you. It's okay. It's just a ramp test. <laughs> like try to talk me off the ledge. Um, yeah. But you know, I'm like still in my cast, just angry at the world uh, but then I started reflecting on the last, you know, two weeks of workouts and my running and I was starting to realize, oh no, the workouts were getting easier. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, that, that third sweet spot interval was just as easy as the first one in my workouts. And okay. So I am getting more fit, even if the ramp test didn't tell me that. And I think I probably could have done that same ramp test just a few minutes later and produce the same result. Mm -hmm. So what I got out of it was, okay, maybe the ramp test. Okay. Well, maybe it was an off day, but if it wasn't just an off day, maybe the ramp test for me wasn't the best way to either measure my FTP or my fitness. So Mm -hmm. I just reflected on the training. I knew it was working even if the FTP test said differently. So I guess what I took away from it is it's important to not just focus on that number and focus on the feel of the workouts as well. Yeah. I think that this is the super exciting part about adaptive training, uh, the new system, because it measures your abilities in each of those energy systems independently. And as you do more difficult workouts, which are prescribed to you, depending on you as an athlete, then you get, you see yourself improve in that regard instead of just going off of FTP, you know? So, yeah. um, I tend to be an athlete like you, or I, I get to a point where I won't see a whole lot of movement in FTP, but I'll see a whole lot of improvement in all other aspects still thereafter. So, uh, usually like in a yearly build. So I think it's really important to have other measures of success and to keep them in line that way. So good on you for looking at like, Oh, hold on. Let me be 
pragmatic about this. Like, is this getting easier? Yes. Can I do more? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's working. Yeah. So, exactly. Um, That's spot on. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about Silver Rush 50. That was July 11th, I think. So the beginning of July, uh, this year. Mm -hmm. And, uh, what were your goals going into that? First of all, did you even know that you could race it with the injury? Like what was that tenuous going into it? I was told I shouldn't do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> is, there's a recurring theme here, right? Kate? <laughs> <laughs> I don't like yeah. to listen to authority. No, yeah. I'm just kidding. Maybe. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was in the hard cast up to Malibu for six weeks. And then it was six weeks in a brace that I could take off. And the brace was didn't restrict my wrist movement. So that second six week chunk was better because on the trainer, it was much better, but my wrist was really sore. So I still mm -hmm. couldn't put a lot of weight on it, but it was still much more comfortable on the trainer. Um, anyway, then I had my, my last appointment with the surgeon was on June 29th and I went proactively and found my own PT a few weeks before that, because I wasn't happy with the progress I was having up until that point. Uh, and the PT was very positive and I was telling them about this race and she said, oh, I think you'll be able to do it. It might not be comfortable. And I don't know if I had told her it was 50 miles, but <laughs> <laughs> um, minor detail. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I went into my surgeon appointment, pretty, pretty positive. Uh, I think I had done one, uh, ride on flat road on my gravel bike before that, just to like feel it out. And I felt good. I was like, Oh, he's going to clear me. This is going to be great. Um, so my appointment with the surgeon, he said I was cleared for weight bearing activity, but you know, gradual. Uh, and I guess I must've brought up the race <laughs> and he, I asked what his thoughts were on that. And he's, Base was like, absolutely not. It was a terrible idea. Uh, <laughs> a little more diplomatic than that, but he did say at one point, isn't that how you hurt yourself? And I immediately started crying. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a very emotional day. Um, but yeah, so in summary, he said that he couldn't recommend that I do it, but the choice is mine. And that just riding, so riding without falling, I would not hurt it. It was very mm -hmm. unlikely that I would re-injure it. However, if I were to fall, it could be very devastating. Not necessarily that that it's that much more likely to, it, to do that injury after surgery, but it wouldn't be able to, the repair would not be as straightforward. Mm -hmm. I would have to use a different tendon or whatever. It would just be a lot more complicated. Um, so that was the verdict. And I didn't like that, obviously. <laughs> and at the same time, I had my PT saying, like, oh, I think you're good. Like, if it hurts, that's it's okay. It's just going to be uncomfortable. Uh, so that weekend, I was also moving the next day from Golden to Boulder. So there's just a lot going on. Mm. That weekend was the 4th of July weekend. I was going to Steamboat in Colorado to mountain bike or well, my friends were going to mountain bike all weekend. I was maybe <laughs> sure, mountain Kate. bike. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So obviously I brought my mountain bike and the first day I was like, I'm just going to do this flow trail. See how it goes with the goal of not falling. Like that's my number one goal. I'm not, I'm not going to fall. And I was going uphill faster than I think I'd ever got uphill. Uh, <laughs> and I have, I got a cross country full suspension bike um, with the anticipation of recent Leadville. So it was my first time riding that. It had just been sitting in the garage waiting for me. Um, and I felt so fit. Um, <laughs> so I was so happy. Uh, the downhill definitely hurt, but I was just happy to be out on the bike. Um, mm -hmm. And the next two days, I kept, just kept riding. And it didn't feel good, uh, but I just was like, I'm not falling. I'm not falling. No matter what, I'm not falling. Uh, and I didn't fall. And after that third day of mountain biking, again, still painful on the downhill, but the climbing, it didn't hurt. Mm. I was like, okay, we're going to do silver rush. We're going to make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, my goal for the race though, was just, just to finish and ha have a fun training day. I had a couple friends doing it and I knew a bunch of people that were going to be in the area. So I was just focused on going and being happy to be on a bike and have fun. And that was about all I was worried about. Uh, I was like, if it puts me in a better crowd, great, but that's for, for the hundred great. Mm -hmm. But 
wasn't counting on it. I really was just looking for a training day. Mm -hmm. So what did you do to prepare for like, let's talk nutrition before the race. What did you eat before the race to load up on carbohydrate? And then what did you eat during? Yeah, I, uh, I ate a lot the few days leading (laughs) up to it. I also, I didn't really do any taper because again, I was just looking at this as a a training day. So I was very Mm -hmm. hungry because I was still like riding a lot that week. Um, trying to write exactly what I, I know the night before I had your typical big pasta dish with a little bit of protein and vegetables, but, um, I don't do great with fiber. So I avoided fiber. Mm-hmm. Um, and pretty much all the, the two days before I was just eating mostly just carbs, um, carb focus with some protein just to hold me over. But yeah, a lot of carbs. I, I don't get too crazy with with uh, my nutrition going into things mm-hmm. or just training. I, it's definitely a, a spot where I could do better. <laughs> but um, day of, I was planning on gels only. Uh, so all gels or in my bottles because um, I had friends in the area. So a couple of my guy friends had big plans to go out and try to win. Uh, so they had people... Cr- a couple of our other friends crewing for them. So they're at the, let's see, the 14 mile aid station. Mm. So yeah, on the out and back. So on the way back, it was 36. Um, so my plan was I would have, I have one K bottle cage on my bike. So I would have that. And then once I got to the aid station, I would give them that bottle and take two. So I'd mm. have one in my cage and then just one in my Jersey pocket. But when I got there, I was pretty confident. I I realized I only wanted to pick up one and then fill it mm-hmm. up at the turnaround aid station because I didn't got want it. one in my in my uh, yeah, that can, jersey. That's actually really insightful because sometimes we just think, oh yeah, I'll just pop it in my jersey. But it seems silly, and we are fragile athletes. But like having a bottle pressing against your spine like that for a while can cause like quite a lot of back discomfort. And then yeah, if it's bouncing on there, then your lower back starts to tense up. And then once your lower back starts to tense up, it can cause a cascade of problems. So right. yeah, prob- probably pretty smart. Yeah. It, it really worked out. Um, and the, the stop I did at, to fill my bottle worked out fine. It took what, 10 seconds. Um, mm-hmm. and I also like, I wasn't really trying to, I was trying to compete like with myself, but I wasn't trying to compete with the field. So I didn't really mind stopping. I was more about comfort. So like just having one bottle and nothing on my back was what was most appealing. So that's what I went for. Um, and then I had, yeah, I just was eating gel, a gel, like every, um, 20 minutes was the goal. I don't think I quite accomplished that, but, um, I had broctane in my bottle. So that was a lot of calories, but I knew from, um, just riding, the 100 course and doing other big rides that solid food, uh, wasn't for me at this Mm -hmm. point. Um, and yeah, mostly because I, I can't eat it. Like Mm -hmm. I can digest it fine, but like actually the process of chewing and swallowing is very, I'm not that coordinated on the bike (laughs) when it comes to that sort of stuff. Like, like if you tried to give me a a water ball cage where you had to pull it from the left with the left hand, I wouldn't even know what to do with myself. Like (laughs) that's how uncoordinated I am. So the gels are also just easier to, to consume and like quicker. Mm -hmm. So that's why I go for the gels and liquid nutrition. So your goal was just to have a solid training day, but you ended up leading the race. Um, and you were leading from early on and you just continued to lead. And I want to ask the question of, did you shift your strategy at any point in the race and did the pressure of being in the lead ever start to like affect you adversely? Cause keep in mind, it's like, have an easy, good training day and definitely don't crash because the doctor <laughs> says that it's not a good idea for you to do this period. So did that ever switch on you? And did you suddenly go into like Uber competitive mode or did you kind of stay even keeled and how'd you do that? If so. Yeah. My other goal that I didn't say, uh, earlier, it was to not blow up. Mm. So thanks to trainer road, I knew what a 30 minute repeatable effort felt like. and the struct, the, um, course profile is very much like do a big climb, have a rest on the descent, do a big climb, rest on the descent. So I knew what those efforts felt like. 
and I knew what I could repeat. So that was pretty much the only thing I was focused on. Um, so yeah, when I got to the first aid station at 14 miles and saw my friend, he told me I was in first and I think I might've laughed out loud. Like it was <laughs> comical. Um, and I was like, oh, well I should probably get going. Like there's probably a, a pack of women like right behind me. Um, and no, I just kept on pedaling though. I pedaled at the same pace uphill. I am a pretty strong descender. So I, you know, I think I passed a lot of the men in like right around me on some of those descents, which was pretty fun. <laughs> oh yeah, that's gotta um, feel real good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, because a lot uh, of people go into those races thinking like you don't really have to be able to descend, but if you can descend, it's gonna help you. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then it just lowers the amount of energy and stress that builds up or energy consumption on the descent, then stress that builds up on the descent. It just makes everything easier. Right. Yeah. Right. And again, I was just happy to be out on my bike. I was having so much fun on those descents, just like <laughs> cheering people on. Like it was so much fun just to be out there. So yeah, I did not change my strategy during the race at all. Um, when I got to the last climb, I like kept looking at my watch. Oh, before this, I lost my bike computer in the move. So I was just like looking at my watch, <laughs> um, looking at the amount of climbing I had left. And I was like, no way. There's no way this is real. I only have that much climbing left. Like, man, I, I just learned so much about what the repeatable efforts feel like on the trainer. And also like something else I really appreciated that I took out of that was, um, cadence. Mm -hmm. Like I do nothing about cadence before trainer row, before I started, before I had those three months on the trainer. And so just like knowing what both cadence and effort feels like and what it should mm -hmm. feel like was so huge. And I just kept on, kept on kept keeping on during the race. No, no strategy change. That's awesome. Uh, with the descent, cause it's a particular, it's more of like a pronounced descent coming back to the finish. Mm -hmm. How'd you manage that? Because there's the psychology of, if you're thinking of don't crash and then you're very likely to crash because you're yeah. fixating on it. So what did you focus on to keep yourself moving forward and obviously not crashing? Yeah. Uh, I was mostly focused on my form. So mm -hmm. primarily keeping my, uh, arms loose. Cause that's probably my biggest offender mm -hmm. descending as I, whenever I get nervous, as a lot of people do, you tighten up your upper body and your arms. So I knew like when I fall, that's usually one of the culprits. So I focused on that. I focused on a couple other things in my form that, uh, I knew it would prevent me from falling. And yeah, I just tried to stay relaxed. Um, that was the biggest thing I would say. Awesome. So you ended up winning. Uh, yeah. How was your thumb after that? <laughs> was it super <laughs> sore? Honestly, it was not, which was such a relief. I, nice. I didn't even notice it much during the race because I was so focused on the race and, you know, focusing on my goals of like not blowing up and not falling that I wasn't really noticing my thumb, which is honestly shocking because even now I am like going downhill a few weeks later, I, I still notice it. So I think it's just the mental mm -hmm. place you're in during a race is you kind of tune out everything else. Yeah. So Leadville's coming up. What's your goal at Leadville? <laughs> uh, and it doesn't have to be goal, a time goal. Could just be yeah. have a good day. Like it, like it was at silver rush. Definitely to have a good day. My goal is under nine hours. Awesome. So yeah, I think it's achievable. You know, I've done the thing where I look at previous year's Silver Rush results and the women and the women that then do go and mm -hmm. do the hundred. I look at their time differences. I'm like, okay, I got this. They could, they did it with that time in Silver Rush. So that's my goal. Um, and I think it's be the both the women and men's pro fields are stacked. So mm. it's gonna be really cool just to like be in a race with people who are so talented. Um, mm -hmm. I think the energy is just going to be going to be huge. So my goal is just to have a fun out there and hopefully go under nine hours. What did you learn from riding the course the first time on a whim like you did? And, uh, what are you looking to apply from that experience to the next one? Oh, I learned a lot. Um, <laughs> I, I learned it's really cold at the start at 6am. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, um, I also have really bad circulation in my hands and feet. So 
I <clears throat> didn't have feeling in my hands or feet for like the first, most of the first climb. So mm-hmm. just be ready for that. It's not going to kill you, but it's going to be cold. Mm-hmm. Uh, I learned that I can't eat solid food during a big day like that. Um, I learned that in, a, in an ideal situation, I don't wear a backpack, but if I have to, I will, or like a mm-hmm. hydration pack. Mm-hmm. That was uncomfortable for me. Uh, I mean, it's, I might end up wearing one anyway because I only have one water bottle cage, but um, I learned that it's going to be a lot easier with with a course with the course being marked because again <laughs> I didn't I didn't <laughs> I had the route on Strava and on Strava there's no arrow pointing to where you need to go and there's no like read out the directions anyway I got lost a couple times <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I added yeah. like five or six extra miles of climbing during it which is so dumb oh jeez. Um, <laughs> Yeah. I also, yeah. Level plus. I also did it on my trail bike. So that was hard. Yeah. Don't recommend doing it on a trail bike. (laughs) (laughs) Holy cow. I did. What was the hardest part of the course for you then? (laughs) Every part? No. Um, (laughs) I would say like the part where I was like, am I going to make it through this was, um, power line. Oh gosh. Yeah. So hard. Like when I got to, uh, for Columbine, I was like feeling pretty good. Uh, that climb, you know, the first mo- like two thirds of it, I guess, probably I just like a smooth road. That's pretty, um, mm-hmm. reasonable pitch until the top. So I felt pretty good for that. And then, uh, yeah, I didn't have enough food and, and hydration on the way back. Uh, so that was a bummer, but you know, there are aid stations in the real race. So that's not really a concern for, for the way back, but yeah. So I just, I learned all those things and it was, it was great. Um, I am so excited to do it in, in better, with better factors at play with, I have a better bike for this time and, you know, so on and so forth. Yeah, this is awesome. Um, Kate, I appreciate you doing this and walking us through everything, tons of learnings about how to stay motivated how to give you what you need rather than just like stay so strictly adhered to something outside of it. Also different ways to measure your success. Um, how to interpret doctor's advice. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe don't listen to what I said yeah. about that though. I hope my yeah. surgeon's not listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. If he's a cyclist, he might be. So, um, but regardless, <laughs> uh, this has just been really cool and illuminating on what on a huge event for a lot of people coming up. So, um, Kate, if people want to get in touch with you to maybe ask further questions or do anything else like that, what's the best way? Um, I am on Instagram. Is that a good, yeah. 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 Uh, my handle is, I think K eight, like the number Kate, I made this a long time ago and I was like, (laughs) two. don't Uh, (laughs) judge, don't judge. Yeah. 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 K eight underscore. McLaffin, M C L A F F I N. Awesome. Cool. Kind of sounds we'll like put, my name, kind of not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's good. We'll put that down below so then people can uh, get in touch with you and cheer you on at Leadville. What corral are you in at Leadville? Uh, I'm in green. Green. Awesome. Right? Yeah, green. <laughs> cool. So, uh, yeah. so if you are there at the race and you go in the green crowd, look for Kate and see if you can find her cheer on on the course. It's going to be an awesome, uh, awesome event. So way to go, Kate. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Absolutely.